let's face it, regardless of what you do or how great a job you think you're doing, discouragement will lift up its ugly head. When it surfaces, how should you handle it? We're continuing our study on the book of Hebrews. The message is directed to the early Hebrew Christians. The book of Hebrew is Paul's letter of encouragement to them and us. Hebrews paints a picture of the key character of the entire Bible, Jesus Christ, our savior and deliverer. This letter is a witness to how deeply God loves all of us. And it testifies of the extent to which God has gone and will go to protect us and save us. I pray that as we go through these series of lessons, we will learn to appreciate even more what God has done for us in the person of his dear son, Jesus Christ. If you find these lessons helpful, click the like button, then click the share button and share them with your friends and family so that they can benefit as well. Also, to receive notifications when a new video is available, click the subscribe button. Father, when trouble comes, we are prone to become discouraged. We understand that you will not remove every doubt and fear that comes before us, but we humbly ask that you give us sufficient evidence to believe, hope, and maintain our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our key text is Hebrews 10, 36. It's a reminder of our need for endurance. It says, for you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. The title of this lesson is Togetherness. Paul, in his letter addressed to the Hebrews, offers some advice for discouragement. What can we learn from his advice to help us deal with discouragement? But first, let's analyze how God helped Elijah recover from his discouragement. Remember Elijah? He was the prophet on the run from a woman after slaying 50 false prophets of Baal. What did God do to restore Elijah's, a true servant of God's faith? We find our answer in 1 Kings 19, 5 through 18, which says, discouraged and disappointed in himself, Elijah lay down and fell asleep. A little later, an angel awakened him and gently said, set up Elijah, I brought you something to eat. Then the angel disappeared. Elijah opened his eyes and saw some bread, freshly baked over hot coals and beside it, a jug of water. He sat up, ate and drank and then lay back down and fell asleep. After a while, the angel returned touched him and said, you have a long way to go. So I brought you some more food. Then he disappeared. Elijah sat up, ate and drank again, and then felt strong enough to go on his way. That food sustained him for the next 40 days as he traveled through the wilderness for almost 200 miles until he reached Sinai. When he arrived, he slipped into one of the caves to spend the night. Then the Lord said to Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah answered, I know I'll be safe here on your mountain. I've been very zealous for you and the honor of your name. I've tried to lift you up as the God of Israel and to get the people to worship you and you alone. They have broken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets. 
What looked like a revival and reformation didn't change Jezebel's mind one bit. She's still in charge of things and out to kill your prophets. I'm the only one left and she's determined to find me and kill me. The Lord said to Elijah, go and stand at the opening of the cave because I'm about to pass by. Elijah obeyed. And as he stood there, a powerful wind came from the direction of the Lord's voice and hit the side of the mountain with such force that it shattered some rocks. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind came, an earthquake. And the whole mountain shook, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came flames of fire that scorched the mountain so badly that Elijah ran back into the cave for protection, but the Lord was not in the fire. Suddenly, all was still. Then he heard a quiet, gentle voice outside. It was the voice of the Lord. Elijah pulled his mantle over his head and stood at the entrance of the cave. The Lord spoke to him. What are you doing here? Elijah said. Lord, I've been very zealous for you to protect your name, but the children of Israel has broken your covenant, tore down your altars and killed your prophets until I am the only one left. Now they are after me. In this quiet, gentle voice, the Lord said to Elijah, I want you to go back to Israel the way you came. Go north until you go to Damascus, to the capital of Syria. As you near the city, a man named Haziel will meet you. I am sending you to anoint him king of Syria. Then come back south into Israel and go to the city of Samaria, where you'll find a man named Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat the grandson of Nimshad, who is one of the Ahab's officers. I want to anoint you to anoint him king of Israel. Then go north toward Jezreel and anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, from Abel to Mohaliah in the Jordan Valley to take your place as my prophet. Soon the Syrian army under Haziel will attack Israel from the north and Jehu will kill anyone from Ahab's house who escapes from Haziel. Then Elisha will pronounce the death sentence on anyone who escapes from Jehu. There are still 7,000 people scattered throughout Israel who have not worshiped Baal. They have refused to kneel down in front of him and have not gone up to kiss his carved images. So Elijah came down from Mount Sinai and went back the way he came. He did what the Lord had told him to do. He anointed Haziel and Jehu and then went to look for Elisha. He found him and the family servants plowing the fields with 12 teams of oxen. Elisha was driving the 12th team. When he saw Elijah coming, he stopped plowing and went to greet him. Elijah said nothing. He just threw his mantle over Elisha's shoulders and turned and walked off. Now, what does the situation with Elijah tell me? Well, it tells me that discouragement and darkness may come. But even in our discouragement, we can take comfort in knowing that God is right there by our side. However, to hear him, we must be silent, for he is not in the loud earthquake, not in the roaring wind, not in the blazing fire, but in the still, small voice. If we quietly listen, he will console and instruct us on what to do. Now, the story of God's dealing with Elijah after Carmel is fascinating because it shows the tender care and wisdom with which God deals with those who are under distress and who struggle to regain their faith. 
God does care for us even when we're suffering. He helps become us to become strong again. God did several things for Elijah. One, he cares for his physical needs. God gives him food and then lets him rest. Two, then he addresses his emotional needs. In the cave, he gently reproves him by saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? And then he, three, he addresses his spiritual needs. He helps him gain a deeper understanding of how he works and feels his purposes. God was not in the wind, the earthquake, or the fire, but he was in a still, small voice, a gentle, blowing wind, according to the New Living Version. This gentle wind shows us an important Bible truth. We may not always see or feel God's work, but we must believe that God is working in us. God always keeps his promise, even though we may not see its manifestation in some profound way. And then God gives Elijah, number four, a work to do and reassures him that he can trust him for what is in store for him in the future. Now, let's look at what advice Paul gives the Hebrews to battle against discouragement. Hebrews 2.1 says, for this reason, we must pray, pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. Hebrews 3, 12 through 14 says, Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast to the, to the beginning of our assurance, firm until the end. Hebrews 5, 11, 6 through 3. Concerning him, we have much to say and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is from the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Therefore, leaving the elementary teachings about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washing and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our assembling together as in the habit of some, but encourage one another and all the more as we see the day drawing near. Throughout Hebrews, we can find instructions that Paul gives the readers to help them regain their original strength and faith. He advised them to one, take care of each other, two, 
practice hospitality by showing kindness to one another, eating together, socializing with them, and socializing with one another. Three, visiting those in prison and providing their needs. Four, sharing their things and giving freely to everyone in need. By so doing, they were assured that God would not forget about them. Then Paul reproves the Hebrews and encourages them. He, five, he warns them not to drift away from the Bible truth. And he also warns them to be careful that none of them have evil thoughts that would cause them to doubt and stop following the living God. And seven, Paul emphasizes the importance of consistent attendance at church meetings. So in summary, Paul not only suggests that they press together, that is come together, he encourages them to encourage one another and stir up love and good works. But he also lifts up Jesus and his ministry for the behalf in the heavenly sanctuary. One could say that Paul here provides a cure for discouragement. That was not only beneficial to the Hebrews, but also beneficial to us as well. So as believers on the borders of the promised land, the borders of the heavenly kingdom, what is Paul's advice to us? Find out in part six, these last days.